Section 1 of The African Problem and the Peace Settlement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The African Problem and the Peace Settlement by Edmund Dean Morell. The Union of Democratic Control. Note. The following pamphlet is published by the Union of Democratic Control because it is a valuable contribution to the discussion of the causes of war and means of its avoidance in future. The object of the Union and its pamphlets is to place at the disposal of the public ideas and information which may create a healthy and informed opinion, but it does not necessarily adopt as its own every statement of opinion therein contained. The five cardinal points are the only principles to which the members of the Union are collectively pledged. 1. No province shall be transferred from one government to another without the consent, by plebiscite or otherwise, of the population of such province. 2. No treaty, arrangement, or undertaking shall be entered upon in the name of Great Britain without the sanction of Parliament. Adequate machinery for ensuring democratic control of foreign policy shall be created. 3. The foreign policy of Great Britain shall not be aimed at creating alliances for the purpose of maintaining the balance of power, but shall be directed to concerted action between the powers in the setting up of an international council, whose deliberations and decisions shall be public, with such machinery for securing international agreement as shall be the guarantee of an abiding peace. 4. Great Britain shall propose, as part of the peace settlement, a plan for the drastic reduction, by consent, of the armaments of all the belligerent powers, and to facilitate that policy, shall attempt to secure the general nationalization of the manufacture of armaments, and the control of the export of armaments by one country to another. 5. The European conflict shall not be continued by economic war, after the military operations have ceased. British policy shall be directed towards promoting free commercial intercourse between all nations and the preservation and extension of the principle of the open door. The African Problem and the Peace Settlement by E. D. Morell The Problem The problem of the future distribution of European political control in Africa and especially of the manner in which the powers interpret and exercise their sovereign rights, is one of the biggest problems which a peace conference will be called upon to solve. The character of the arrangements reached will have a profound effect upon the future of international relationships. The part which Africa has played in the past 30 years in producing international friction is not fully realized by British public opinion. The part which Africa must play in promoting international friction in the future, unless the relations of Europe and Africa can be placed upon a statement-like footing, can hardly be exaggerated. The continent of Africa is more than three times the size of Europe. Strategically, its northern coasts have always been of great importance to the Mediterranean powers, and to the ebb and flow of international rivalry which has surged up and down the southern coasts of Europe. Under the new conditions of naval warfare, the whole of the African coast assumes a new significance in the relations of the powers, especially if the settlement which closes this war is the kind of settlement which will produce fresh wars. But even if the wholesale slaughter and waste of the past three years succeeds in affecting the moral sanitation of European statecraft, Africa must still be a factor of deep significance in the lives of European people. Indeed, in the nature of the case, Africa will be of far more immediate concern to Europe than it has been in the past. For Africa may be likened to a vast natural storehouse, situate at the very gates of Europe. All the products which the modern industrialism of Europe requires and will increasingly require, oils, fats, foodstuffs, valuable timbers, minerals, are all there. The peoples, too, of Africa are endowed with an unsurpassed physical strength. The industry and muscles of the African peoples have made the southern states of the American Union 
the purveyors of raw cotton of the world. They have contributed materially to the prosperity of the Latin states of South America, and under adverse circumstances, they have already created and sustained a great export of tropical raw material from Africa itself. In the five years preceding the war, the Gold Coast, for instance, exported 7,367,338 pounds of raw cocoa, and in the same period, Nigeria exported 21,144,000 pounds of palm oil and kernels. These are native industries carried out by the natives themselves as free producers, working on their own socially owned land. The problem of Africa for Europe is a dual one. It is a problem of statecraft and a moral problem. Is Africa to continue to be a bone of contention between the governments of Europe, an increasing source of friction and of rivalry? Or will the governments, under pressure of an informed public opinion, agree to participate in what Africa has of value for them and for the world by agreement, by cooperation, by the exercise of sane and just conception of things? And again, will the races of Africa continue to be treated as they have been, too often in the past with callous and cruel selfishness? Will their legitimate rights continue to be, as they have been in a very large measure, trampled underfoot? Are these mighty forces of labor, which improved facilities of communication are unleashing daily and making more accessible, to be regarded merely as so much material for the enrichment of European interests, ministering adjuncts to European state ambitions and to European capitalism? Are the peoples of Africa to be drilled, armed, and conscripted to assist European nations in exterminating their European neighbors? Is the power of modern Europe to be utilized in enslaving the African both economically and militarily? Or will the governments of Europe, under pressure of an enlightened public opinion, turn over a new leaf in their treatment of the African races, recognizing that both on the ground of justice and humanity and on the ground of wise government, government based upon study and understanding of their polity, of their needs, and of their tremendous possibilities under just and far-seeing guidelines. Between the problem of statecraft and the moral problem which Africa presents to Europe, there are many links of interconnection and interaction. An African cancer, product of bad European administration, infects the body politic of Europe. An attempted monopolization of the raw material of Africa by this or that European power in the interests of its own nationals has its repercussion upon the international relations of Europe. The conscription of African peoples must, by a natural sequence, involve the arming of all Asia, and that, in the fullness of time, means the destruction of European civilization. If the greater part of Africa could be prevented, by enlightened political, economic, and administrative measures, from being a source of constant international friction, one of the most fruitful causes of European unrest would tend to disappear, and one of the greatest dangers to the future of the European peoples would in process of time be wholly removed. I shall endeavor in this pamphlet to set out these truths as briefly as the complexity of the subject allows, and to indicate a policy which, alike on its European and African side, can prepare a better future for Europe, for Africa, and for the world. 2. Africa and Europe From the earliest times, Africa has materially influenced the destinies of Europe and of all mankind. It gave birth to the most wonderful civilization the world has ever known. An African empire, it was, which successively disputed with Greece and Rome for supremacy over the ancient Mediterranean world, holding sway throughout extensive territories in southern Europe. At a later stage, an empire of mixed Arab and Berber origin directed from the shore of Africa the invasion of Spain, where for seven centuries it maintained a civilization in many respects greatly superior to anything which Europe was then capable of evolving. The stream of African humanity, which flowed for centuries from Africa into America, fertilizing its natural resources, 
powerfully contributed in transforming European colonies into great and independent nations. After the cessation of the overseas slave trade, Africa bulked for a time less largely in the world's affairs, but the period of inaction was short. In the last quarter of the 19th century, Africa began again to take a large share in molding European history, but a more direct and intimate share than in any previous epoch. Thenceforth, Africa was fated to become a matter of vital concern in the lives of all Americans. To the ordinary working man in his family, the very names of Africa's rivers and mountains are unknown. To the average politician, its existence is little more than an abstraction, and yet the past 35 years, during which the political invasion of Africa by Europe has been consummated and practically the entire continent divided up among sundry competing and hostile European powers, will rank as among the most disturbed in the modern history of Europe. In this invasion, this attempt at direct exploitation of Africa's resources by a capitalistic Europe has been largely instrumental in promoting the disturbances from which the peoples of Europe have suffered with ever-increasing intensity. Not once, but repeatedly, have the peoples of Europe narrowly avoided being plunged into war in the course of this period, and disputes over the possession of African territory, or in connection with the exploitation of certain areas in Africa, have been the most invariable reason. The origins, both directly and indirectly, of the war have been laid to a considerable extent in Africa, the clashing ambitions of European governments in connection with Africa have sown seeds of international animosities in Africa which have yielded lamentable crops in Europe. As Africa was largely concerned in promoting the war, so Africa will be largely concerned with the eventual settlement which will end the war, ended in a dawn of hope for a more reasonable world, or in a morass of bitterness in which the peoples of Europe will before many years have passed, flounder hopelessly again. The future of an entire continent cannot be determined by the accidents of military conquest, either in Europe or in that continent itself. It is important, then, that we should familiarize ourselves with the political divisions and distribution of European territorial sovereignty in Africa as they existed before the war, that we should glance at the historical events which have produced them that we should examine some of the internal problems of Africa as they are affected by European enterprise and some of the factors in the modern exploitation of Africa by the governments of Europe. 3. Distribution of European Sovereignty in Africa When the war broke out, the British, French, Germans, Belgians, Portuguese, and Italians shared the bulk of European sovereign rights in Africa. Spain's dependencies were trifling in number and extent. Two parts of Africa had retained their political independence, Abyssinia and Liberia, although the so-called Liberian Republic is largely a fiction. The British dependencies in Africa, administered by the colonial office, consist of Nigeria, British East Africa, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Nyasaland, Gold Coast, Ashante and Northern Territories, Gambia, Basutoland, and most important is Nigeria, with an area of 336,080 square miles, i.e. the size of the German Empire, plus Italy and Holland, and over 17 millions of inhabitants. Basutoland, Swaziland, and Bechianoland are geographically within the limits of the Union of South Africa, but the colonial office controls their administration through the High Commissioner. The Union of South Africa is a self-governing dominion with an area of 473,575 square miles and a population of just under 6 millions. Rhodesia is controlled by the British South Africa Company. To this list must now be added as definitely British, Egypt and the Sudan. The total area of British Africa thus amounts to 3,517,322 square miles, an area larger than the whole of Europe, with a population of some 51 millions, 
of whom about one and a half millions are Europeans or half-breeds. The French dependencies of Africa consisted of Algeria, Tunis, West Africa, French Congo, Saharan region, Somali coast, Madagascar, and Morocco, embracing a total area of 4,537,570 square miles, with an estimated population of 36 millions. The German dependencies in Africa consisted of Cameroon, the Cameroons, German East Africa, German Southwest Africa, and Togoland. Total area, 1,022,100 square miles, with a population of 12,497,470. Belgian Africa consisted of the former Congo Free State, annexed by Belgium in 1908, with a population which, during the quarter of a century of Leopoldian misrule, had sunk to about 8 millions, area just under 1 million square miles. Portugal's dependencies consisted of Angola and Cabinda, Portuguese East Africa, Guinea, and the Cocoa Islands of San Tome and Principe. Total 723,382 square miles. Italian Africa consisted of Tripoli, Italian Somaziland, and Eritrea. Spain possessed one or two strips of territory on the west coast and on the northern and western coasts of Morocco. 4. The Natural Divisions of Africa The greater part of Africa is not suitable to colonization by the white races, i.e. Europeans cannot people it. It is essential to a proper understanding of the African problem to bear this in mind. Broadly speaking, Africa can be classed in three main divisions. A where climatic and other conditions permit of Europeans rearing families of healthy children and establishing the foundations of a European community in the true sense of the term. B. Where climatic conditions, while not so favorable to white colonization, are not wholly unfavorable, but where the numbers, capacities, or characteristics of the indigenous population are such to render white colonization impracticable. C where climatic conditions make the evolution of any European community totally out of the question. This division, as already stated, is by far the most extensive. It follows, therefore, that nature has set limitations to what Europeans are able to accomplish in Africa by direct action, even in the A, or most favored, division of the continent. European colonization can only be of a partial kind, no white community can stand alone in any part of Africa. All the more arduous forms of manual labor must, save in a very limited degree, be undertaken either by the African or by the imported Asiatic. The problem of government must always be complicated by the difficulties incidental to the juxtaposition of two races, the indigenous race being, moreover, vigorous and prolific. In B Division of the Continent, Still greater obstacles exist to European colonization properly so called, i.e., to the substitution of European communities for the indigenous population. This division is virtually confined to northern Mediterranean Africa, viz. Tunis, Tripoli, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco. The indigenous population is relatively dense, and no white proletariat could compete with it. Moreover, large sections of all these territories are ruled out of possible European settlement, either by the climate or the soil or both. Much of Tunis and Tripoli is complete or semi-desert country, and although artificial irrigation was achieving wonders before the war, at no measurable period can it be anticipated that these regions will contain a European population actually living on the land. Division C of the continent is the huge territory comprised within or bordering the tropical belt and forming, roughly speaking, three sides of a square between the 18th parallel of latitude north and the 15th parallel of latitude south. Here, life, in the case of 90 Europeans out of every hundred, is a constant struggle for the preservation of health. 
and here too is the greatest natural preserve of tropical raw material in the world oiled palms rubber vines whose accursed juices have been the death potion of so many millions of africans in the congo regions timbers infinite in variety and of great value precious gums resins oil-bearing plants and fibers here will flourish with luxuriance tropical plants of economic value not indigenous to africa this is indeed the natural home of all those tropical products which the modern industrialism of europe requires in ever-increasing quantities here britain france and germany have carved themselves out within the last thirty years spheres of influence sometimes by agreement with native chiefs sometimes by violence this part of africa has always been a fertile field for all that is bad and cruel in european psychology for here is a human material responding amazingly to fair dealing and honest administration but a human material as dough in the hands of the slaver and exploiter five the partition of africa we can hardly discuss the african problem from the point of view of the future european settlement without giving a brief summary of africa's connection with europe in modern times the annexation period may be said to have begun on the one hand with the revival of french colonial ambitions after the disasters of eighteen seventy and on the other with the commercial and missionary impulses largely british which followed in the wake of the discoveries by the great african explorers in the latter part of the nineteenth century it may be well to point out that although european activities in africa had existed for many hundreds of years the european governments in the main and with three notable exceptions have been chary of committing themselves to political action beyond the coastline with the rebirth in france of the passion for a great colonial empire the second period in the modern history of africa the period of political absorption direct intervention and international partition was ushered in the scramble for africa began from their base on the senegal the french directed numerous political and military expeditions into the region of the niger swooping down from the interior to the coast and threatening to cut off the british coast settlements from the interior trade which would have greatly minimized their value they invaded tunis and plunged into the sahara from algeria working westwards round southern morocco at the same time from their base at libreville on the on the gaboon estuary they pushed into the congo basin they declared war upon madagascar marched upon the capital occupied the whole island and deported the queen all this they virtually accomplished in a decade a prodigious feat meantime africa north south east and west was looming large in the vision of british statesmen alarmed at the progress of the french in the west the british government took various measures to counteract it and to strike in while there was yet time especially in the richest part of the western region the niger delta and along the lower course of the great river itself a charter was conferred upon a body of merchants who under the name of the royal niger company made treaties with hundreds of potentates along both banks of the niger and with the powerful fulani hausa emirates of sokoto bornu katsena etc now known as northern nigeria similar british activities in the east followed the exploring and administrative feats of thompson and sir harry johnston and the diplomatic abilities of sir john kirk at the court of the sultan of zanzibar who claimed authority over the mainland the imperial british east africa company was founded with the result that very large regions in the interior right up to the great lakes came under british suzerainty in the south the first serious conflict between britain and boer had ended in a victory for the latter but the discovery of diamonds and subsequently of gold and the advent of sasal roads were destined to change the whole face of affairs in the north the administration of egypt was a source of increasing complexity and mutterings of the coming storm in the sudan swept down the nile a third great power germany then entered the ring 
German explorers had figured conspicuously in the geographical opening up of Africa, and the old traditions of the Hanseatic towns were reawakened. A colonial party arose in Germany, its aims Bismarck contemptuously and growlingly opposed. Events, however, proved too strong for the Chancellor, and before long he was engaged in epistolary duels with Lord Granville over Agra Picena, the coping stone of the future German Southwest Africa, over the Cameroon and over East Africa. All this staking out of African claims by the French, the British, and the German governments filled the diplomatic world of Europe with a clamor of bitter quarrels. These quarrels were sometimes transferred to the soil of Africa by the representatives of the different nations engaged, and the local competition of zealous officials was aggravated with disastrous consequences for the natives by the sectarian animosities of competing religious sects. Uganda ran red with native blood, owing to the quarrels between the French party, composed of French Catholic fathers, and the British party, composed of Protestant missionaries. In the midst of the confusion, the sinister shadow of Leopold II was thrown upon the scene. Attracted by Stanley's discovery of the course of the Congo, he founded an international African association, summoned the explorer to Brussels, and dispatched him on the association's behalf to make treaties all along the banks of the mighty river and its affluence. Expressing profound abhorrence at the exploits of half-caste Arab slave traders, whose depredations in the eastern part of the Congo Basin had been revealed by several explorers, he appealed to all the philanthropists in Europe to applaud his initiative, which he declared to be the moral and material regeneration of sad-browed Africa. When Stanley returned in due course with the treaties in his pocket, the king invited the world to recognize the association as a free and independent African state. At this time, the chief object of the British government was to keep France out of the Congo Basin, owing to the differential tariffs by which she everywhere opposed our trade. Lord Granville did not trust Leopold II and supported the Portuguese government, which was raising counterclaims to the king's, claims based upon ancient historical achievements of Portuguese explorers. However, France and Germany supported, for different reasons of their own, King Leopold's so-called philanthropic enterprise, which was also favored by the British missionary societies and by the British chambers of commerce, both of which subsequently repented their actions when it was too late. The upshot was that King Leopold acquired an area in tropical Africa as large as Europe, minus Russia. The century was not to close without a further series of dramatic events in the shape of the British conquest of the Sudan, the Jameson Raid, and the resultant Second Boer War, followed in turn by Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman's grant of self-government, and the ultimate founding of the Union of South Africa, and the crisis with France over Marchand's arrival at Fashota, France's final effort to force the Egyptian question and undo her previous errors. The opening years of the present century witnessed the burial of the Anglo-French colonial hatchet, the Italian descent upon Tripoli, the disappearance of the Congo Free State, and the advent of Belgium as an African power. Africa had been all but swallowed up. It looked as though the feast would terminate without the powers actually coming to blows. But Morocco and Abyssinia still remain unabsorbed. Morocco is more easily accessible to European Pacific penetration in its various forms. What the assimilation of all the remainder of Africa failed to do, Morocco accomplished. It provided a goodly portion of the fuel for the fire which was to consume the peoples of Europe. So much for the past. What of the future? What can be done to prevent Africa remaining a bone of contention between the European powers and giving rise to further friction? Once again, perhaps, sowing seeds yielding crops of deadly import to the peoples of Europe. That is the African problem in its fundamental aspect as it affects the Europe of today. The African Problem and the Peace Settlement by E. D. Morell Part 2. This LibriVox recording 
is in the public domain. 6. The Menaced Africa As I have already shown, it is the enormous regions of non-colonializable Africa, with their vast potential natural wealth, which affect the industrial interests of Europe most nearly. It is rivalry for the possession of these regions, which has been responsible, in the main, for the acute rivalries between the powers, rivalries which almost precipitated the peoples of Europe into war upon numerous occasions in the past thirty years. If the European people are to regard themselves as trustees toward the millions of more or less primitive Africans inhabiting these regions, and not as exploiters, the policy they authorize and instruct their representatives to pursue must concord on certain basic principles. Despite all superficial talk to the contrary, the European peoples whose governments have undertaken the task of ruling colored races cannot in their own interests wash their hands of the moral responsibilities involved. These moral responsibilities are no longer confined to the government. They are shared in by the peoples democracy must face and grapple with them. Improperly understood, the interests of these millions of Africans correspond with the legitimate utilitarian interests of the European democracies, although they may and do frequently conflict with the interests of individual Europeans or groups of Europeans. If European administration in non-colonizable Africa is to be inspired by the sense of trusteeship, what are the basic principles upon which its action must be directed? There are six in number. 1. The preservation of the land for the peoples of the land, by whom alone its natural resources can be developed. The land needs to be preserved both from the European exploiter, that is the major danger, and in regions which have become affected by the gradual infiltration of European laws affecting land, property, and secession, from the rise of a privileged land-owning class within the native communities themselves. I use the expression of land-owning in the sense of involving the right of sale, which is contrary to native customary law, and which, if tolerated, must lead to the dispossession of the mass of the people. 2. The preservation of native institutions from the solvent effect of European contact, a contact which is inevitable and inexorable upon those institutions, and the strengthening and perfecting of them to meet the strain imposed thereon through that contact. 3. The preservation of the principle of trade, that is, the right of buying and selling, and the economic relationship of the European and the African, or expressed in a different way, the preservation of the proprietary right of the natives and the products, whether natural or cultivated, of their land. 4 the regulation of the operation of trade in order to preclude the creation of combines and monopolies which tend to debar the native producer from obtaining a fair market price for his produce, and in order to abolish or restrict any particular trade proved to be injurious. 5. The abolition of artificial restrictions on trade, such as differential tariffs. 6. The encouragement of native industries. These principles are in constant peril. The slave spirit is still rife in Europe. It exists among us. The war has intensified it. Morality was never at a lower ebb in Europe than it is today. Every war makes a scrap heap of morality. The sense of pity, of justice, of perspective, and fair play still exists among the millions who are flung together in the field of massacre. But outside the arena of mutual sacrifice, it has temporarily almost disappeared in the tension of a prolonged and frenzied struggle, and in the fears entertained by the rulers of Europe as to what the future holds in store for them, when the peoples realize the full burden which they will have to carry. It is precisely in these fears that the peril of the subject races, and especially of the most helpless among them, the African races, resides. The end of the war will find the belligerent people staggering under a load of debt frightful to contemplate. The ruling and wealthy classes must succeed in alleviating this burden, or submit to a complete upheaval of society and its existing forces. Revolution or relief, that is the alternative which everywhere will face them, which even today faces them, and revolution in this case will go much deeper than a mere change of dynasts 
than a mere alliteration in the forms of political machinery. It will be a social revolution, in the fullest and profoundest sense of the term. It will involve a radical transformation of the social order, rotten with cynicism, hypocrisy, and selfishness. How can the peril be averted? Probably it cannot, and it is best so. But there will be an attempt, many attempts, no doubt, to avert it. And even were the portents not writ large upon the horizon, one attempt at least is easy to forecast. This will consist in an endeavor to convert into exchangeable values, with the utmost possible speed, the raw material of the tropical world, by the servile exploitation of the races which inhabit it. That is the danger which threatens non-colonizable Africa. To confront that danger betimes, to confront it with a clear understanding of the problems of Africa, and especially West Africa, the part of the continent which is richest in actual and potential wealth, must be the task of those who decline to admit that Africa shall be made to pay for Europe's sins. And it will be well to bear in mind that a policy of expropriation, exploitation, and wrongdoing requires more than a mere negative attitude to ensure its defeat. It must be opposed by a policy of construction based upon truth and buttressed by knowledge. 7. Non-colonizable Africa should be neutralized. We may now consider what measures can be devised which shall lay the foundations of such an international treatment of the African problem as will eliminate one of the active causes of the European unrest and one of the potential causes of European war. The means to this end are plainly indicated. They would consist in neutralizing the greater part of Africa and in internationalizing commercial activities within the neutralized areas. By neutralization, I mean the removal of the greater part of Africa, by mutual consent, from the operations of European war. By the internationalization of commercial activities, I mean that irrespective of the distribution of sovereign rights, the nationals of all European states shall be entitled to compete on equal terms in every form of commercial activity throughout the neutralized area. There is nothing utopian in these proposals. They are easily realizable if the European governments really intend to bring about a stable peace, and if the leaders of European democracy can be induced to understand the enormous practical importance of the matter. For my part, I also plead for these measures on behalf of helpless peoples who cannot themselves be represented at the peace conference, but whom the great war has cruelly wronged, and whose happiness and well-being are bound up in Europe, ceasing to treat them as the chattels of her lusts and her quarrels. These proposals are substantially an amplification and precision of the purposes of the Berlin Act. I would make the neutralization binding, not optional. I would extend the area of the Berlin Act nominally affected, and I would make its so-called free trade clauses more definite and more comprehensive. What happened at the Great African Conference, which closed its sittings at Berlin in February 1885, and to which all the powers participating in the African scramble, and a number of other powers not directly concerned with Africa, were signatories, including the United States. What happened was this. Footnote. The famous West African Conference, known as the Berlin Conference, was held in 1884-85 at Germany's invitation and the rules and regulations it drew up are known as the General Act of the Berlin Congress, or, more shortly, the Berlin Act. Fourteen powers were represented. All of them ratified the Act, except the United States of America. The United States took an active part in the proceedings of the conference, but did not eventually ratify its conclusions. The United States government did, however, ratify the Brussels Act of 1890, which was the sequel to the Berlin Act. Moreover, the United States government was the first government to recognize King Leopold's International African Association, afterwards the Congo Free State, as the flag of a friendly government. It was on the basis of these acts of the United States government that the distinguished British signatories to the memorial, which I handed to President Roosevelt in 1904, relied in making a direct appeal for American intervention to assist in putting an end to the Congo scandals. 
and it was on these acts that the subsequent agitation in america was founded and america's official cooperation finally secured there is therefore an established precedent an ample justification for my suggestion that the united states should participate in any african settlement which may be reached and which would not be wholly concerned with questions of the distribution of european sovereign rights End of footnote. the conference marked out an area in africa and declared a that it ought to be excluded from the effects of disputes between the signatory powers b that there should be free trade within it these signatory powers declared prince bismarck who presided over the sittings have sought for the means to withdraw a great part of the african continent from the vicissitudes of general politics and confine the rivalry of nations to the peaceful competition of trade and industry that is the policy which i recommend should be revived but in a more positive form i recommend that means should not only be sought but found that the policy so far as the first part of it is concerned should be made collectively binding and that it should embrace the whole of non-colonizable africa so far as the second part of it is concerned experience has shown as i explain in the next section that the words free trade are too vague to ensure the security of that internationalization of commercial activities which is indispensable if the fatal errors of the past are to be avoided in the future and the guarantee it is well to emphasize should not merely be a guarantee by the powers exercising sovereign rights in africa nor should it be confined to the powers of europe it should be a collective guarantee in which the united states and all the european powers belligerent and neutral should participate and if the south american powers and the great independent asiatic powers japan and china were brought in also it would be all to the good for some such measure as regards china will have to be evolved among the world's statesmen if china is to be spared the agonies which africa has endured and if china is not to follow africa in becoming the graveyard of european peace two arguments against these proposals that once suggest themselves why not neutralize the whole of africa why confine neutralization to a certain area the reply to that criticism is this the neutralization of the whole of africa is not a practical proposition unless the general peace is of such a character as entirely to preclude the possibility of war again arising among the nations i'm not sanguine enough to assume that the settlement even if conceived on sound lines can embody so categorical a prophecy no settlement can do that the democracies alone can ensure it if the settlement is of a kind which will permit of collective and sustained democratic effort to that end working concurrently with the league of nations as visualized by president wilson meanwhile we must limit our aspirations to what is realizable the other argument is this the berlin conference failed in effect to secure the limited neutralization which it laid down witness the extension of the war to the very regions which the berlin act professed to neutralize in view of so lamentable an abandonment under stress of war of the provisions of the act what is the use of proposing on a larger scale substantially the same policy which broke down at the very first test superficially the argument is plausible but under examination it is seen to be singularly weak in the first place the neutralization clauses of the berlin act are so framed that they constitute not an obligatory but an optional undertaking in the second place the geographical limitation of the neutralized area under the act was a fatal bar to the realization under stress of war of the policy the act sought to promote in the third place professedly neutralized territories under the act were never treated as such in the course of the international rivalries which ensued after the berlin conference was held and this altogether apart from the consideration that a principle is not necessarily unsound because the first attempt to apply it has not been successful men do not proceed on that assumption either in their private or in their public acts neither do nations a philosophy of that kind would be destructive of all reforms if a principle is a right principle 
its adoption must be urged until it meets with general acceptance. It is on those lines that Europe must proceed. Article 10 of the Act reads as follows. In order to give a new guarantee of security to trade and industry, and to encourage, by the maintenance of peace, the development of civilization in the countries mentioned in Article 1, and placed under the free trade system, the high signatory parties to the present Act, and those who shall hereafter adopt it, bind themselves to respect the neutrality of the territories or portions of territories belonging to the said countries, comprising therein the territorial waters, so long as the powers which exercise or shall exercise the rights of sovereignty or protectorate over those territories, using their option of proclaiming themselves neutral, shall fulfill the duties which neutrality requires. Article 11 reads as follows. In case a power exercising rights of sovereignty or protectorate in the countries mentioned in Article 1, and placed under the free trade system, shall be involved in a war, then the high signatory powers to the present Act, and those who shall hereafter adopt it, bind themselves to lend their good offices in order that the territories belonging to this power, and comprised in the conventional free trade zone, shall, by the common consent of this power and of the other belligerent or belligerents, be placed during the war under the rule of neutrality, and considered as belonging to a non-belligerent state, the belligerents thenceforth abstaining from extending hostilities to the territories thus mentioned, and from using them as a base for warlike operations. The failure of the powers has, therefore, been a moral failure, not a violation of international law. The policy they sought to promote is not invalidated by that failure. The policy in question was not enshrined in international law as a policy binding upon the parties, but merely as a pious hope which it was left to the option of the signatories to consummate. Moreover, as I have already pointed out, the neutralization purpose of the powers was never given a fair chance. It was vitiated over and over again by some of the signatory powers. The experience which has attended the working out of the optional clauses of the Berlin Act as regards the neutralization of a part of the non-colonizable area of Africa do not, therefore, in any way weaken the proposals here set forth for a neutralization which shall be binding upon the powers throughout the entire non-colonizable area of Africa. 7. The Trade of Non-Colonizable Africa and Its Internationalization And now for the equally important and interconnected issue, the internationalization of commercial activity within the neutralized area. Let us deal first with the notable insufficiency of the expression free trade used in the act of the Berlin Conference. To do so intelligibly, it is necessary to give some indication of the nature of the commercial intercourse between Europe and Africa in the area affected. The vast territories which I propose should be neutralized and commercially internationalized are, as we have seen, situate almost entirely within the tropical and subtropical belt and are wholly unsuitable to the growth of a white civilization. They are not occupied in any real sense of the term. Some parts of them, even now, are little more than superficially explored. Europeans are thinly scattered over them in twos and threes, administrators, officials, merchants, missionaries, in many cases in the larger administrative centers and seats of government. Political authority is exercised by individual Europeans of experience and strong personal character, with three or four assistants and a few native police and when the local administration is conceived on sound lines, with the support of the natural chiefs of the country in their councils of elders. The moral force of that misapplied word prestige is what under normal rule assures the safety and authority of the white administrator. The insanity of carrying the war into Africa will have made the exercise of administrative functions much more difficult Africans have been deliberately pitted against Europeans by Europeans. The aftermath will involve many disasters and much bloodshed. These Europeans are birds of passage. 
those who were not engaged in the work of administration or in the task of inculcating the christian religion are in the main traders or rather the local assistants of trading firms established in europe these are the most numerous what is this trade it is the exchange of the raw material collected or grown by the african for european goods and cash imported by the european or by the europeanized african trading firms it is a trade in which the true partners are the african producer i e collector preparer and grower of raw material and the european workingman who a manufactures the goods sold in africa to the african for that raw material and who b turns that raw material into the finished product after it has been conveyed to europe and discharged at the european port this partnership ought if the democracies of europe and especially those democracies whose governments control african territory were properly instructed by their leaders to create among the working classes at home a real and active interest in sympathy with the african producer it is in the direct interest of the working man of europe that the african producer should be a free man and not an economic serf that he should have open markets in which to sell his produce that his purchasing power should not be artificially and unjustly restricted by administrative action or capitalistic combinations operating to keep down the price of the produce to the producer of it that the african producer should not be the wage slave the european workman has become and from which condition he is striving to emancipate himself in the preservation of african rights in the soil of africa african ownership in the products of africa african opportunity to dispose of those products to the best advantage of the african is concentrated the very essence of the struggle which democracy is waging in europe against capitalism the working classes of europe can only remain indifferent to the claims of the producing classes of africa to their own detriment to resume the african and the african alone is able to collect cultivate and prepare the raw material which europe requires and nothing but the attractions of trade i e the desire to acquire the goods which the european has to sell can induce him to do so nothing i e except processes of violence which may be temporarily successful but which cannot be permanently successful because they destroy the african and by destroying the african they destroy the value of tropical africa to europe and the world now what the berlin act meant when it stipulated that the area affected by its provisions should be a free trade area was this it meant that irrespective of the distribution of european sovereign rights in that area europeans of any nationality and not only europeans but non-europeans should be as free to trade to barter to buy and sell with the native africans as the subjects of the particular european power which enjoyed political control i e sovereign rights in this or that part of the territory it meant that an englishman or a german or an italian should be as free to trade in the part of the french congo affected by the act as a frenchman that a frenchman or a spaniard or an austrian should be as free to trade in the congo free state as a belgian a belgian a swede a dane or an american should be as free to trade in german east africa as a german the act gave every european of whatever nationality that right it was not to be interfered with and hampered by hostile tariffs simply because he did not happen to be a subject of the european government controlling the particular region in which he had chosen to set up his business the object of the provision was twofold it ensured a fair and open field for all merchants and therefore for all manufacturers for the merchant is only the middleman between the european manufacturer of goods for the african market and the african producer of raw materials thus eliminating all possibility of international friction arising out of complaints of unfair treatment to europeans of this or that nationality trading in the dependency of a european power of which they were not citizens and it gave to the african producer the right to dispose of his products to the best advantage it opened the international market to the fruits of his labor he could sell freely in the market which paid him the best value for his products 
By its free trade stipulations, the conference had achieved a really constructive and most valuable piece of international African legislation, which, unlike the neutralization clauses of the Act, was binding upon the signatories. And the proposal I venture to put forward is that this principle of freedom of trade, consecrated by the Act, should be extended over the wider area which I urge in the preceding chapter should be neutralized, but that just as neutralization should henceforth be obligatory and not optional, so should freedom of international trade be internationally safeguarded from the dangers which experience has demonstrated the Act did not provide against. And so should the same principle be applied to commercial activities which are not, properly speaking, designated under the name of trade. To this aspect of the matter I shall return in a moment. This would be asking of the powers concerned no more than that they should recognize as just and right for the whole of non-colonizable Africa what they collectively recognized as just and right for a part of non-colonizable Africa. But the mere extension of free trade clauses in a new international act to the whole area of non-colonizable Africa would be insufficient without a clear definition of the character and procedure of tropical African trade, and of what free trade in tropical Africa involves and necessitates, and without a definite prohibition of practices which imparted the very area reserved to free trade under the Act, not only destroyed free trade, but extirpated trade itself. Both the definition and the prohibition are essential if the internationalization of trade is to be an effective measure in the process of eliminating Africa as a cause of future international friction. How was this astonishing result brought about? We must recall it if the necessity of guarding against similar dangers in the future is to be adequately realized. We have seen of what the trade of non-colonizable Africa consists, viz. the exchange of raw material gathered, prepared, or cultivated by the African for imported, manufactured goods. Now it occurred to the ingenious minds of King Leopold and his financial associates, who desired to obtain the greatest possible quantities of raw material, in the case of the Congo it happened to be, in the main, wild India rubber, from the Congo in the shortest possible time, and at the lowest possible cost, that they could effect their purpose, and still profess to have adhered to the free trade clauses of the Act, by giving the European sovereign rights in Africa an interpretation which none of the eminent experts and jurisconsults who attended the conference had ever conceived, let alone provided against. They proceeded in this wise. By a series of royal edicts, the India rubber, another raw material of a marketable nature, was declared to be the property of the Congo Free State government, i.e. of the Congo Free State, i.e. of the king, together with the land itself. The idea that the India rubber was the property of the native population, i.e. the citizens of this African state, having been thus summarily disposed of, it automatically followed that the native inhabitants had no proprietary rights over the India rubber, no right to gather, prepare, and sell it, trade in it, in short. Such being the case, obviously European merchants were not entitled to buy the rubber from the natives, and to trade in it with the natives. Rubber had ceased to be a tradable article. It had become, by royal edict, the property of a king who embodied the state. A native gathering and preparing and selling India rubber to a European for manufactured goods was a thief, caught red-handed in the disposal of property which did not belong to him, subject, therefore, to condign punishment. A European merchant buying India rubber from the natives was clearly a receiver of stolen property and entitled to prosecution. Confronted with the charge of having violated the free trade clauses of the Berlin Act, at the expense of the native population, and at the expense of international trade, King Leopold blandly replied that the question of trade did not enter into the matter at all, as a state was fully entitled to dispose of its own property in the manner which seemed best to its directors. On this basic interpretation of European sovereign rights in Africa, the king proceeded to delegate a portion of his rights 
to sundry financial corporations in which he retained an interest. The Congo was divided into a number of concessions and farmed out to concessionaire companies in which the king vested his claim to the India rubber and other raw material of the country. The native, having been thus deprived by a stroke of the royal pen of his proprietorship and the products of the soil of his country, which he alone could gather, was thereupon compelled to gather those products for what it pleased the concessionaires to pay for them. The native refusing, the element of force was brought in to compel him. Hell reigned in the Congo after that. Thus was inaugurated the concessionaire system in tropical Africa. In twenty years it destroyed more Africans than the slave trade destroyed in three centuries. It was imitated by the French in the French Congo, where it gave rise to similar inevitable abuses and destruction of native life, although on a smaller scale. For the bulk of the French local political administrators were bitterly opposed to the whole policy, which had been thrust upon the dependency by political and financial influence in Paris and Brussels. The Germans were also induced to adopt the system in the Cameroon, but abandoned it almost at once, and when British merchants were being driven from the French Congo, they were enjoying immunity from molestation in the German Cameroon. The system is now generally discredited. It has been abolished in the Belgian Congo, and has virtually perished from its own internal corruption in the French Congo. Nevertheless, it may be revived again, not necessarily on the Congo, for it provides a simple method whereby the European capitalist can secure the natural wealth of tropical Africa without paying for it. Indeed, we are threatened today with the applications of precisely the same system to the British tropical African dependencies. The scheme of the Empire Resources Development Committee, with its program of developing the resources of the empire, by a combination of the state and financial corporations, is supported by arguments which are identical with those used by the royal gang which worked its evil will in the Congo for two decades. The land of the natives is said to belong to the state, not to an African state, be it noted, but to the British state. The products are the property of the empire, and the natives must be made into useful members of society for the benefit of the British state and its allied corporations. A crafty appeal is made to the British working man to support this immoral policy on the grounds that he will be able to unload a portion of his war taxation on the back of the African native. Any further international legislation affecting the internationalization of trade in non-colonizable Africa should be so drafted, then, as to preclude the recurrence of similar scandals by a fuller definition of what is meant by trade and by the freedom of trade and by the insertion of safeguards to prevent so monstrous an interpretation of european sovereign rights in africa ever being revived and enforced what is really wanted is the elaboration of a charter of native rights for this immense region of the dark continent where the native must always constitute the main factor upon whom everything depends, a charter which, dealing with the fundamentals and not with the characteristics, which must always vary, in accordance with the varying national characteristics of the governing people, of administration, could be subscribed to by all the powers. The available material for the elaboration of such a charter has been largely added to by the labors of the West African Lands Committee, appointed by the Colonial Office, two years before the war, of which the late Sir Ken L. Digby was the chairman, of which the author was a member, and upon which were represented officials of great African and colonial experience, both administrative and legal. The committee collected a vast amount of evidence, and it would be unfortunate if that evidence, together with the report of the subcommittee, were not made publicly accessible in order to assist in any serious and unselfish effort to solve the African problem. Footnote. The committee itself did not complete its labors owing to the war and to the death of the chairman. End of footnote. One other point needs to be touched upon in connection with the internationalization of commercial activities in non-colonizable Africa. 
we have dealt hitherto with the internationalization of trade properly so called which as previously explained transcends all other forms of commercial activity in this part of the world but although trade is the predominant feature it is not the only feature of european economic enterprise in non-colonizable africa there are railways to be built bridges piers docks wharves to be made public buildings for which the material is purchased in europe to be constructed there will be more and more work of this kind to be done as the opening up of the continent proceeds in this respect only the fringe of non-colonizable africa has yet been touched machinery of all kinds will be a steadily increasing item of import and the bulk of the purchases for these purposes will be government expenditure then in certain areas there are deep level mining enterprises already in being their numbers will increase the mineral wealth of non-colonizable africa happily for the natives is yet largely uninvestigated assuming trade internationalized what about enterprises directed by the local governments is the construction laying down and setting up of railways bridges waterworks electrical installations and the like in for example a british dependency to be exclusively reserved to british firms in a french dependency to french firms in a german dependency assuming such a thing to exist after the war to german firms or can a system of international tenders be substituted the question is one which does not possess very great actuality in non-colonizable africa today nothing like the actuality it presents for instance in china but tomorrow it will be much more in evidence although it will never in non-colonizable africa approximate in importance to trade then again are such enterprises as the exploitation of mineral deposits or the refinement on the spot of certain vegetable deposits which later may in time trench upon the field of ordinary trade and which it is within the gift of the local governments to facilitate or withhold to be exclusively reserved in a british dependency to british nationals in a french dependency to french nationals and so on here too is a question which should be frankly faced in any scheme of internationalization of commercial activities enterprises of this kind must increase in volume and in importance the more the matter is looked into the more difficult does it seem to exclude mineral exploitation from an internationalization scheme this would not mean of course that foreign nationals would be entitled to carry on mining indiscriminately it would only mean the absence of differential treatment in the granting of prospecting and mining licenses as for international tenders for the construction of public works there would be an obvious mutual advantage if the powers immediately concerned in the economic development of non-colonizable africa arrived at an agreement amongst themselves to grant reciprocal treatment to one another as a first step this would be calculated to avoid friction where friction might be regarded as most likely to arise this arrangement should not preclude any of the powers concerned from casting the international net more widely if they choose i can imagine the same objection being raised to the confinement within the non-colonizable area of africa of the proposal for an internationalization of commercial activities as i raised in anticipation with regard to the neutralization proposal that objection must be met on the same grounds as the former the proposals i make are linked they aim at the attainable it is inherent in the modern british conception of empire that the centre cannot dictate their internal policy to the parts the british government cannot dictate to the government of the union of south africa the commercial policy it shall follow this forbids the idea that the french can be expected to go further in regard to north africa and if algeria and tunis are to be left outside any immediately realizable international agreement tripoli cannot well be regarded as on a different footing to its neighboring mediterranean dependencies in egypt it is of course open to us to pursue our pre-war policy of the open door or the reactionary policy of the paris conference the case of morocco is peculiar 
I'm not sufficiently versed in international law to know whether the elaborate arrangements concluded between France and Germany under the Franco-German Convention of November 1911, which postulated the complete internationalization of every form of commercial activity in that country, legally survive the war or not. If they do not, then Morocco seems to me to enter automatically into the economic orbit of the other Mediterranean dependencies. If the convention does legally survive the war, then the economic development of Morocco would proceed on much the same lines as the proposal made here for non-colonizable Africa, of a similar kind in connection with European enterprise in Abyssinia and Liberia, the two regions of the continent where recognized native governments exist. Such, then, are the constructive proposals I venture to recommend with a view to removing the greater part of Africa from the arena of international friction, with the background of history, physiology, ethnology, and economics necessary for an understanding of the African problem in its essentials. I have not attempted to go into details or to indicate the successive steps by which these proposals could be made to enter the sphere of practical politics. I have been concerned rather with the materialization and projection upon the international screen of a project which I feel to be sound and practicable. Of this I am profoundly convinced. A solution to the African problem on such lines as I have indicated is an essential agreement in the immortal required to lay the structural foundations of a lasting peace in Europe, irrespective of and in addition to the question of the future distribution of European sovereign rights in Africa. To the latter question, the next and concluding chapter is devoted. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. The African problem.